Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is wound rotor induction motors. Our objective is to discuss the construction and theory of operation of wound rotor induction motors as well as examine the mechanical and electrical properties while in operation. We'll additionally examine how varying rotor resistance one can control the speed and torque characteristics of wound rotor induction motors. If you've been following this lecture series in its intended sequence, you'll recall we previously acquainted ourselves with the larger motor family tree, various properties common to all motors, and then like some heavily caffeinated squirrel, climbed high into the squirrel cage induction motor branch of the motor family tree and rattled every leaf, shook every twig, and gnawed every acorn. Then we climbed back down and back up again to the electrically excited synchronous motor branch of the motor family tree and similarly broke every branch, knocked out every bird nest, and thrashed every pine cone. Today, we're going to climb back down and back up again into the wound rotor induction motor branch of the motor family tree and do the same thing. Before we do so, let's pause at the split between the three-phase AC induction motors and three-phase AC synchronous motors and discuss some commonalities for these two important styles of three-phase AC motors. Both synchronous and induction three-phase AC motors are characterized by a rotating magnetic field on the stator. The speed of the rotating stator magnetic field is known as the synchronous speed and is directly proportional to the excitation frequency and inversely proportional to the number of pole pairs per phase. Additionally, the direction of the rotating stator magnetic field can be reversed simply by interchanging any two stator leads inside a three-phase AC system. Lastly, one can determine rotating mechanical power in units of watts as a product of torque in newton meters times rotational speed in units of RPM divided by the constant 9.55. These properties remain true for all three-phase AC motors, synchronous and induction. The division between synchronous and the induction split in the three-phase AC motor branch is based on performance with respect to the synchronous speed. As the name implies, the rotor speed of a synchronous motor matches, follows, is otherwise synchronized or locked in step with that of the state of rotating magnetic field, whereas the rotor speed of an induction motor, the topic of today's discussion, is not. The rotor of an induction motor must by necessity slightly lag behind the synchronous speed for them to function at all, even in the no-load condition. It is for this reason induction motors are sometimes called asynchronous motors, meaning not synchronized. I say again, the rotor of a synchronous motor is synchronized with the state of rotating magnetic field, whereas the rotor of an induction motor is not. The rotor of an induction motor must by necessity lag behind the state of rotating magnetic field for them to function at all. This is to suggest that within their operational range, synchronous motors are fixed speed motors, whereas we might expect the rotor speed of an induction motor to vary as a function of applied torque. Let's now leave this junction and climb up into the branches of the induction motor family tree and get to work wrecking this place. Within the induction branch, there are two main types, squirrel cage induction motors and wound rotor induction motors, the topic of today's discussion. As one might expect, all members of the three-phase AC induction motor family, regardless of a construction, make use of a rotating magnetic field in the stator, and we should expect the rotor speed to vary as a function of applied torque where the differential between the resultant rotor speed and the stator synchronous speed is known as slip, often expressed as a percentage, using the formula synchronous speed minus rotor speed divided by synchronous speed times 100%. Both squirrel cage induction motors and wound rotor induction motors exhibit this behavior. The principal difference between a squirrel cage induction motor and wound rotor induction motor is rotor design. You'll recall, the rotor of a squirrel cage induction motor is an inexpensive cage-like structure of cast aluminum or copper. Despite their simplicity and cheapness, these types of rotors aren't easy to manufacture above a certain size. For this reason, rather than casting the rotor, wound rotor induction motors, as the name implies, use wire wound coils on the rotor, which substantially simplifies the construction for larger motors. Additionally, wound rotor induction motors feature slip rings and brushes on the rotor. You recall a slip ring is a metallic ring mounted on a motor shaft and electrically insulated from the shaft, whereas a brush is a sliding contact that rise along the slip ring, allowing connection to a stationary component. Wound rotor induction motors include three slip rings, designated as M1, M2, and M3. Customarily, M1 is the outside slip ring, M2 is in the middle, and M3 is closest to the rotor. You recall, squirrel cage induction motors don't have any connections to the rotor and operate via non-contact induction only. Wound rotor induction motors also operate via non-contact induction also. However, because the slip ring allow access to the rotors, Wound rotor induction motors allow a degree of customization not possible with a regular squirrel cage induction motor, which leads us right into a discussion about rotors. Think back to the squirrel cage induction motor mechanical properties lecture and answer this question. What is the difference between a Design B squirrel cage induction motor 
and a Design D scroll cage induction motor. If you said C, that is correct, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. A more appropriate answer might be that Design B and Design D scroll cage induction motors exhibit different speed torque and mechanical power characteristics. You recall the speed torque curves for Design B and Design D scroll cage induction motors look something like this. Design B motors, a commonly available motor suitable for numerous applications like blowers and pumps, exhibit relatively linear speed torque behavior near the rated condition, which tapers off, peaks, and then diminishes as the motor enters the breakdown region. Design D motors, in contrast, are designed for high inertia starts like a crane or a hoist. As evidenced by their speed torque curve, Design D motors produce high torque at low speeds. These speed torque curves imply that a Design B motor experiences peak mechanical power output, the product of torque and speed, occurs at less slip or a faster rotational speed, whereas a similarly rated Design D motor experiences peak mechanical power output at more slip or slower rotational speed. This again points toward the intended purpose of these different types of motors. Design D motors favor the lower speed, higher slip, higher torque applications one would expect for high inertia loads. Besides differing speed and torque and mechanical power curves, there are several other fundamental differences between Bs and Ds, the first being rotor resistance. Design D rotors, in comparison to Design B rotors, feature conductive bars with higher resistance. The second notable difference between B and D motors is their efficiency. Design B motors are relatively efficient, whereas Design D motors, not so much. Meaning a Design D style motor will consume more real electrical power input to produce an equivalent usable mechanical power output. Lastly, given Design D motors specialize in high torque, low speed applications, they exhibit less inrush current demand upon closure of a full voltage starter. So wouldn't it be great if you could have the high torque starting ability and low inrush current demand of a high resistance Design D rotor and when the load is actually moving, switch back over to a low resistance design B rotor such that it operates more efficiently at higher rotational speed. Well, check it out. Wound rotor induction motors allow this duality. This would be impossible for a squirrel cage induction motor lacking access to the rotor. However, wound rotor induction motors with slip rings on the rotor permit a degree of customization to the rotor circuit, thus a degree of flexibility to meet the needs of a particular application. You want design B operation? don't add resistance. You want design D operation? Add resistance. Additionally, a primitive form of variable speed operation can be accomplished by varying the resistance of wound rotor induction motor rotor circuit while in operation. Allow me to demonstrate. Let's first examine the two different extremes of operation. Consider three fixed resistors in a Y configuration connected to the rotor slip rings. It's important to realize this bank of resistors is stationary and external to the rotor. However, because of the slip ring, are continuously included in the rotor circuit in series of the rotor windings regardless of the physical orientation of the rotor. With the resistors in the rotor circuit, the motor behaves just like a Design D scroll cage induction motor exhibiting high torque at low speeds and lower inrush current at startup, however will operate slightly less efficiently. In contrast, consider an occasion where the rotor slip ring connections are tied together as in the central node of a Y configuration. This is a low resistance configuration where only the natural resistance of the rotor windings is taken into consideration. With no additional resistance in the rotor circuit, the motor behaves just like a Design B scroll cage induction motor exhibiting more efficient operation at higher speeds. One way of toggling between D and B operation is with a shunt contactor in parallel to a rotor resistance bank. When the shunt contactor is open, the external resistor bank is placed in series with the rotor and the motor operates like a high resistance Design D squirrel cage induction motor. In contrast, when the shunt contactor closes, the resistor bank is shorted out or bypassed, excluding them from the rotor circuit, and the motor operates like a low resistance Design B squirrel cage induction motor. This is a common arrangement for a type of reduced voltage starter known as a secondary resistor reduced voltage starter. You'll recall we examined several types of reduced voltage starters in the motor control playlist, all of which are designed to limit inrush and modify the starting torque of motors under the direction. You'll recall one of the methods we examined was a primary resistor reduced voltage starter, which in start mode places starting resistors in series with a stator and then bypasses them in run mode. This method would work for both squirrel gauge induction motor and wound rotor induction motors. This being said, wound rotor induction motors also allow access to the rotor. A secondary resistor reduced voltage starter, in contrast, operates similarly. However, it does so by placing starting resistors in series with the rotor, not the stator, and then shorts them out in run mode. 
In start mode, the open shunt contactor places the secondary resistors in series with the rotor, and the motor exerts high starting torque with low inrush current, characteristic of a Design D high resistance rotor. Once a certain prescribed time has passed, or once the motor has reached a certain rotational speed, the shunt contactor would close, shorting out the resistor bank, and then the motor would operate more efficiently at higher speeds, characteristic of a Design B low resistance rotor. We'll examine the details of hardwire relay-based ladder logic and PLC-based implementations of secondary resistor reduced voltage starters incorporating timers and rotational speed switches in later lectures. Rotor resistance needn't be an all or nothing implementation. Consider a bank of resistors and shunt contactors. When all shunt contactors are open, resistors A, B, C, and D are placed in series with the rotor, thus the rotor experiences maximum resistance. When shunt contactor 1 closes, only resistors B, C, and D are placed in series with the rotor, thus the rotor experiences less resistance. Similarly, when shunt contactor 2 closes, only resistors C and D are placed in series with the rotor, thus the rotor experiences less and less resistance, and so on. Stage closures of shunt contactors 1, 2, 3, then 4 essentially allow a more gradual transition from high to medium to low to no resistance in the rotor circuit. You might use this type of stage secondary resistor reduced voltage starter for a heavy load that it takes some time to bring up to speed or decelerate. It's important to realize the resistors employed in these types of starters aren't ordinarily intended for continuous operation and should be switched out in time before they're damaged.